Hi, folks. This is Keith. This is Andy. Welcome to Brockton Bay. Time once again for the Brockton Bay Chronicles, reviewing Worm by Wildbow. This is the podcast where my good friend and co-host Andy and I talk about his first time reading of Worm. Andy, what's up for review today? We'll be reviewing Arc 7, Buzz, chapters 1 through 7. And just a reminder, our breakdown of Arc 8 will also be spread over two episodes. After we wrap up Arc 8, we'll do an episode reviewing the story so far. And this week, we have a couple of comments from YouTube to talk about. We have a new subscriber, Daxfer, making a contribution. And Daxfer says, as a recent reader who has finished Worm, it's fascinating to hear a blind reader's opinion and an older reader's occasional insights as well. Well, welcome, Daxfer. We're glad to have you along with us, and thanks for your contribution. And we also have some additional feedback from our regular uh, contributor, Megafire7, who, in his uh, comment to us, was glad to see that the uh, dogs get some well-deserved recognition. Uh, that's referring to your uh, giving uh-huh. the key character of the arc to Brutus last week. Gotcha. Megafire also has a question based on... Um, where things are at this moment. So let's see what you think of this. On another note, now that Taylor has chosen the path of villainy with her new friends, do you think she'll come to enjoy it? What, uh, what say you? Well, I'm probably not a great person to ask. Back in the day, I played a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and I was almost universally always a paladin character, some kind of goody good character. The one time I tried playing a kind of an assassin type character, I kept ended up doing good things for people or not following through on missions. And my DM would make me do uh, alignment saving roles. And I went from chaotic evil character to a neutral good character over the course (laughs) of the campaign. So Uh I always think people are going to turn back to good. I think, you know, I don't know that people ever enjoy, except, you know, there are the rare people that enjoy villainy. I think people turn to villainy because the system has failed them in various ways or that they feel they need to uh, right wrongs and it's not happening the way that it should or as fast as it should. Or in the case of Taylor, trying to be good, trying to work within the system has not worked well at all for her. She's found friendship and companionship with a group of supervillains and realized they're not Dr. Doom type, you know, just wipe everybody out. And uh, they're, they're humans that have made choices just like anybody else. And uh, so I don't think she's going to enjoy villainy so much. I think she'll enjoy the camaraderie and most likely will rationalize things as she goes if things do get worse and she has to do things that she doesn't uh, want to do or or don't align with her personality. But I don't know that she'll come to enjoy it. I'm guessing she'll always be kind of the voice of moderation in the group, uh, trying to get them to take a less villainous path (laughs) whenever possible. So it's uh, primarily about the companionship for her, huh? Uh, At this moment. I definitely think so. I mean, for somebody of her age to make the huge amount of money that she's made, you know, that hasn't really affected her. But the the fact that the people have been there when she had the bad concussion, they they have uh, understood her plight, but also abided by her wishes not to get involved. I think she's really, you know, connected with them on a lot of levels. And I think that's that's the key component here. So I think uh, it's not about, you know, getting away with stuff or being a rebel. I think it's more about uh, the companionship. Well, very good. And thanks again, Megafire7. We really, really enjoy your contribution. Please keep it coming. It uh, keeps, us on its, keeps us on our toes and uh, really 
makes us think. So we appreciate you. And now we'll move on to our point by point discussion, Arc 7, Chapter 1. And it's the next day after Taylor's big uh, fight with her dad. And we find the team at the loft. Brian and Taylor are doing a little sparring. Taylor seems to really want to take advantage of Brian's knowledge and, and get better at hand to hand combat. And we see Lisa getting some uh, giggles as the two of them do this, uh, this sparring. It's uh it's an interesting scene. I totally understand Taylor wanting to get better as a martial artist or hand-to-hand combat person. Uh, she had to do a lot of that in the, the big scene a while back. And uh, you know, I think it worked out really well and she improvised really well, but the way she's into the introspection and, and kind of reviewing how she's done, you could see her wanting to, well, I could have done this better. How, what could I learn that would have, you know, wouldn't have made that such a near miss or whatever. So totally makes sense. Lisa is just being Lisa. She knows Taylor's got a thing for Brian and that's, that's what girls and guys do, right? They kind of give each other a hard time. So yeah, I definitely took this as another one of those. Yes, remember these are teenagers moments, and, <laughs> and I, I kind of enjoyed that. Definitely, yeah. I, uh, I mean, it's it's been a long time since I was in that position, but a lot of years have passed. But it's it's still so vivid. You know, those memories that happen to you when you're a teenager they really loom large, and you know, having feelings for somebody, not knowing how to deal with it, not knowing how to bring it up and having other people give you a hard time about it. I had a teacher that was going through like a achieving your dreams type class or something in high school. And he said, well, you know, write down what you really want on a sheet of paper and post it by your bed and look at it all the time. And then, you know, and so there was this girl I had a big crush on. I put that up in my room and of course, my best friend saw it, and then he brought it up in math class. With the teacher, you know, <laughs> and he's got a little dream thing up on his bedside wall, and I was like, "Dude, shut up!" Oh, jeez. But uh, you know, that's that's friends. They're like, they're not. It's not a mean thing. It's just to get a reaction and and give you a hard time about it. But uh, yeah, Lisa is very, very much either a, a really getting into the friendship or the maybe slightly older sister kind of thing with uh, Taylor. So that's good to see too. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot more of um, another side of Taylor, a, a, a deeper look at her as she's coming to terms with where she is at this moment in life and, and dealing with this cute boy. She's uh, she's <laughs> obviously got a thing for. So the team decides it's time to, to gather around and to discuss Coyle's offer. And at the in- onset, Brian brings up to Alec, uh, what Coyle had kind of intimated about his origin and the team presses Alec and says, Hey, you know, tell us, tell us where you came from. Tell us who you are. Uh, give us some details. Um, what did you think about Alec's origin story? If you will. That was kind of a trip. I think wild Bo does a great job of deciding on a, a power or a group of powers. And then branching off in the different directions. You know, what if they use it this way? What if they use it this way? What if it had this component? And so they compare Alex's dad, uh, Heartbreaker, to uh, Gallant and uh, how they have similar capabilities, but you have one that has a conscience and then Heartbreaker, which, you know, who has no conscience and uh, uses it all for his own gain trying to imagine what it must have been like growing up as a kid in that uh, it's pretty, pretty shocking. I mean, it's like, it's like if, if Jim Jones had the, that kind of ab- ability to, to really emotionally affect his followers kind of thing. Well, and you know, they say that regular human charisma when it's, when it's amped up is like that, you know, I was never a fan of president Bill Clinton I read somewhere that there were people that were even more against him than I was 
that uh, interviewed him and his charisma was at such a level that with just talking with him for a few minutes, they started feeling a connection with him. They started feeling like, hey, this is a good guy. And it was only later that they kind of realized, whoa, what happened there? Yeah. So you can imagine if it was uh, a parahuman with something similar to that, that, yeah, you'd have no chance. But I actually had to pause for a while after reading Alex's origin. And really? uh, well, yeah, it just was so disturbing the way he described 18 kids, most of them babies, you know, the dad moving heaven and earth. If something was going on with them, somebody was trying to take them or hurt them. But if nothing was going on like that, then he had no time for them unless it was just to test them or try to get them to uh, trigger. So it was just, it was so messed up. Yeah. Like you said, a cult on steroids. Uh, so. Yeah. And we find out that Alec is the second killer on the squad. And I think you had speculated early on that, yeah, he was your choice for who, who was the second killer, but you thought it might've been an accident as a result of his trigger event. Whereas what we're actually finding out is Wildbo decided, decided to make it a deliberate act. Right. Yeah. So I was kind of half right, I guess. It was once, once you knew heartbreakers deal, you, you could see that he'd be, yeah, trying to manipulate everybody, including his own kids and try to get a hold over everybody. So it, it, it definitely totally hung together the way wild Bo wrote it, but that doesn't make it any more creep, any less creepy. As they're getting down into the nitty gritty of this, Brian asked Alec, what happens if your father sends one of your brothers or sisters, or he himself decides to come with to which Alec responded that he'd probably just take off. And Brian kind of extended some camaraderie and said, or we could help you out kind of thing. Alec had just kind of, kind of rolled off his back. He didn't just kind of shrug and like, you know, whatever, either way. Yeah. I think Alec is definitely been conditioned by that environment he grew up in to kind of assume that everybody's got some hidden agenda or somebody's everybody's always tried to, to do something to manipulate him. And you can hardly blame him for feeling that way. So, you know, he doesn't want to ever appear too eager or too connected or too impacted by the group. He's just kind of, Hey, you're cool to hang out with now what you're doing aligns with what I'm doing. But yeah, if, if things don't go well, I have no problem just bailing out. So, but I think it's a very valid point that, you know, typical teenage reaction, just pass it off. Like, Oh yeah, be no big thing. It's like, this guy sounds like a heavy hitter. Yeah. And if he decided to come in and change things, I don't know that the undersiders would be able to, they might not even see it coming, you know, heartbreaker would manipulate some people, get them to, you know, do the, Oh, I'm in the alley. My leg's broken. Empire 88 is after right. me. And, and they go to try to help. And then, you know, they get jumped and beat to a pulp. So I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty nervous about heartbreaker lurking in the background. Yeah. They, it, it would be a challenge for them. I thought it was cool that Brian extended that team defense to him. Um, but yeah, like you said, he kind of just let it roll off his back so, uh, as it were. Yeah. And I think that's a great, great point. You know, I didn't really think about that too much, but that's another reason that this seems less like a, a villainous group, right? If, if it was real, everybody out for themselves kind of thing, that'd be like, you know what, Alec, you're too much of a liability. You can make people trip and stuff, but mm. you know, that's not enough to warrant us having this time bomb sort of following you around and, you know, see a, but here they're instead going the totally opposite way. We'll back you up, you know, right. we'll, we'll take on this guy. So, you know, again, I think that shows that they're not, they're not evil people. You know, they're, they're people who've made some choices to do things for valid reasons and they're doing the best they can trying to, you know, be good people. I agree. So the team gathers around the couch and they have a discussion on about Coyle's offer. Brian makes a suggestion saying that this is too big of a game changer for how they operate, that it shouldn't just be a majority vote, that it should be a complete consensus. 
again, showing, showing maturity as a, as a group of kids, uh, understanding the weight of what they're, what they could be entering into. They take a vote after a discussion, everybody's in favor of it, except for Rachel. Big surprise there for me. I mean, Rachel is kind of anti everything, but I didn't think she would, uh, she would just flat out say no, but her reasoning, you know, kind of makes me feel bad because I feel like I talk too much too, but you know, she says he talks too much. (laughs) Only reason people talk like he does is if he, if they're covering something up and you know, a lot of times people will do that, try to overwhelm me with a wall of words, kind of hide their real intentions with a lot of flowery uh, rhetoric. Prose, rhetoric, exactly. So I, I think she's got a point, but the, the team, the team feels like it's, it's worth the risk. And so Rachel's definitely in a, in a very small minority. And instead of just rejecting everything outright, um, Brian convinces her, says, Hey, we've got a week. Why don't we, we discuss this a little bit further. We don't have to, uh, give Coyle an immediate response. Rachel is going to go to one of her, her dog shelters and do her thing. And Taylor asked if she can go with, she had um, said to herself, I told myself I wanted to connect with these guys. And I, that wasn't going to happen. If I just sat back and participated only when invited, I had to put myself out there. So she offered to go with Rachel to care for her dogs. what do you think of that? Well, Rachel reacted about the way I expected. You know, she she thinks that people are always against her and, you know, she can only trust her animals and that based on the context that Taylor's just going to come and try to debate her into agreeing uh, with the with the proposal from Coyle. But it it's an interesting back and forth. And, you know, Rachel grudgingly finally says, well, you know, I don't care if you come along or not, but their deal is that if she gets pissed off, she gets to uh, a free punch at Taylor. uh, And she's apparently okay with that. Brian's not too, too happy with it, but, but Taylor, I think is, is sensing that. Yeah. If I'm going to bond with people, I got to bond with everybody or do do my best to try to do that. I liked how, how Taylor, um, she she continues to try to find herself, and and in this back and forth with with Rachel, when Brian tries to intercede, Taylor makes it clear that she is handling this situation, and she doesn't want Brian to to get in the way of it. Yeah, Taylor really is kind of looking to Brian for leadership, and you know, if not, kind of trying to say that out loud to everybody she's definitely following his lead and supporting him in a lot of things and apologizing when she can't support him but in this case yeah she's again kind of uh, spreading her wings a little bit and saying you know what i've got a plan here trust me and brian to his credit is like all right well run with it see how it goes hey what do you think of brian as a leader i think you commented once he's not he's obviously not the traditional leader of a gang of villains and threatening and, and, and physical violence or whatnot. But what do you think of him? I, I think he's doing a pretty good job. You know, he's one of those uh, young men that kind of had to grow up fast and has had uh, a lot of responsibility put on him at a young age. And that's definitely got him being more responsible, caused him to mature a little bit faster And I think he's in a great group where he's able to interact on a, on a friend level kind of with most of the folks and understand enough about like Rachel and sometimes Alec when he's being a goofball on how to kind of handle them, but then also, you know, bring out the best in them. So I I think, I think he's doing a really good job actually. And walking that fine line between, yeah, we're villains, but we're not, you know, a death squad. Yeah. Definitely not monsters. 
So Rachel and Taylor head over to Rachel's makeshift dog shelter on a different location on, on the docks. They have some quiet time along the way. Uh, Taylor does try to try to get her to talk a little bit, ask questions without uh, without being annoying. And we get to the dog shelter and we see see bitch as she relates to her to her dogs. Quite a scene there with all the mass of canines rushing out and and trying to interact with Taylor. And Taylor's not necessarily a, a pet person that we know of, but you know, she's willing to try and, and, uh, but then the dogs start getting into it as dogs sometimes will. And that's, you know, freaks her out. Like it would freak out most people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, Rachel is able to deal with it and, and Taylor's able to, you know, kind of roll with it. And it's, it's cool that Rachel's got this, you know, and is trying to help out these vulnerable creatures and, and give them a better life. At one point, as the as you were saying, the the dogs were kind of uh, acting as dogs do and, and swirling around Taylor's feet. Taylor takes a moment to in order to get her mind settled. She to center herself. She reaches out with her power. She closes her eyes and kind of feels around uh, the the insects and sw- possible swarms in in the vicinity. And she notices that one of the dogs in Bitch's care has something going on with her and we with him Sirius was the dog's name and wild bull finds this extremely cool way to help us gain insight into how bitch's power works this whole scene was was really interesting uh the way wild bull described the swarm or mass of bugs that was somehow you know squeezing right up next to Taylor, even though she hadn't really sensed that there were there and then her, you know, realizing that, Hey, no, there's something wrong with a dog, you know, and it's not fleas, it's not ticks, but she doesn't know enough about pests to know what it might be. So right. she shares that with Rachel and Rachel knows right away what it is and is mad because, you know, the shelter hasn't done their job or the previous owner hasn't done their job, hasn't been responsible with their pet. And so but the insight, as you said, into uh, Rachel's powers is pretty cool. And it makes total sense when you take a step back. You know, the, the animals, uh, Brutus and, and the rest of them, when they get really big, you know, they, they look like they're, or the description of them make it sounds like they're about to fall apart. And then when they shrink, you know, chunks of them fall off and stuff and, and so the only way that that would kind of work is if they were somehow, you know, ha- had the super health or whatever, or something that was in the, in the modification process, kept them extra healthy. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, Rachel apparently is, has come across this before and is able to get rid of the heartworms with, uh, by making serious start to grow. Uh, the problem is that as you can imagine, dogs take a long time to get used to that process. Yeah. And Sirius has not had any training. So uh, she has to have the other dogs help out. Which was extremely cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty neat. But it makes sense, right? I mean, Rachel's the leader of the pack. And and so she's going to turn to them for help in whatever the situation is. And uh, like I said, she's probably been through this before, but uh, a really neat description, really neat way of healing the dogs so yeah much as as with during the bank heist uh when panacea set up that feedback loop um i get the same kind of vibe how wild bull set this up uh, the kind of detail mm. you know again who thinks of this and in part of explaining how her power heals the heartworms um you know it's extremely creative i thought Definitely. Yeah. And I keep getting this mental picture of, you know, because I'm a software developer at heart, uh, a flow chart, mm. you know, where parahuman has this power, good arrow goes this direction, bad <laughs> arrow goes this direction, uh-huh. you know, and, and, you know, and then there are different branches that keep going off. Yeah. He's, he's found a way to continue to 
expand and and stretch the ideas of these powers yeah vivid imagination at work here to to come up with these new wrinkles so as we move into the the latter half of chapter two and into chapter three we see taylor really making an effort and i think having a, a modicum of success uh relating to to rachel and, and actually starting to figure out how to how to, to respond to her using a bit of canine psychology i was reminded of that discussion that taylor had with lisa back a while where lisa said that you know rachel might not even have the kind of the ability to relate to typical human body language cues or you know just might misinterpret them or right. and so taylor as has been a common theme you know you tell taylor something once and she kind of remembers it and ponders it and and is able to recall it when when she needs to kind of like uh i think you alluded to her being the utility belt type person so she kind of has a mental utility belt and she she puts these things in her in her mental arsenal definitely it's a great way to to think about it that she's got these different tools and strategies and file stuff away if it doesn't pertain at the moment but it's it's there to to bring it back out as needed and she she tries typical human interaction with Rachel and can see that Rachel's, you know, not enjoying it. It's, it's bothering her. So she brings up that thing and says, okay, well, how could I try to make this more take away any room for misinterpretation, make it as, as vanilla as I can and as straightforward as I can. And uh, she's able to do that. Yeah. And she, she gets the food for them and they, then she starts playing with the dogs and, but she does again, kind of do a little bit of uh, flexing her willpower, if you will, when Rachel starts trying to use her like a, a gopher to do whatever she wants, you know, and, yes. and dominate her. And, and Taylor it, speaking in particular, when, when Rachel sent her off and said, Hey, why don't you go clean up the, uh, the dog poop and, Taylor's like, no, I'll do it when, <laughs> when you are out there with me with a shovel in hand and we will do it together. We are equals. And when it came time to, to go out and get some food, how she, the little things, how she approached Rachel, uh, something as simple as where should I go get, go get lunch from, for us. And I, I like this Taylor. I like, uh, I like to see this from her. She's on the one hand, it's, you can say it's compassion. She's trying to bring, she's trying to react better to Rachel. And on the other hand, it's, it's personal growth and strength from, from Taylor. Well put. Yeah. She's able to recognize that a particular phrasing could be triggering to Rachel. So she, she turns it around. So it doesn't appear that she's weak or needing help. And, and Rachel responds to that. So yeah, Taylor's definitely maturing right before our eyes. And so, so the, the girls are, they have lunch and Taylor plays fetch with uh, a couple of the dogs and she queries, queries Rachel to give her some of the histories on, on some of the dogs. And then trouble comes knocking trouble in the form of some skinheads from empire 88. There's always some fly in the ointment, you know, uh, but that's in order to keep moving the storyline along, uh, a good author like Wild Bo has to have different crises pop up fairly frequently. Can't just have an idyllic afternoon of two team members bonding at the dog shelter set up in the old building. You know, there's got to be got to be something happened, got to move the narrative along. So yeah, unfortunately the, the white supremacists show up and uh, do their, their ugly stuff that they do. What did you think of Taylor's swarm gambit as I'm, as I'm phrasing it? That was very interesting. You know, I think it's a great counterpoint to what we were just saying, you know, that Taylor's doing a great job of learning things and avoiding past mistakes. But on the other hand, she's still a teenager. Sure. So it hadn't even occurred to her that, oh, maybe I should 
if we're going out and things are, you know, in turmoil, I should have my costume in a backpack or something, or yeah. I should be prepared. You know, I was like, no, I'll go. I'll just try to, she's so hyper-focused, which, you know, oftentimes happens to, to young people like that. They get locked into one thing and they forget they're supposed to call their parents that they weren't coming home or forget that they had that project due the next day. Cause they were busy, you know, taking care of something else. So the swarm gambit, as you put it, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty, not inventive. a fan, not, not, not a fan of the skin, the, of, of the bugs crawling on the skin, the bear skin. No, not, not a fan <laughs> of that at all. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Yeah. I, I'm definitely one of those people that, uh, I get an ant crawling on me. And then for the next four hours, I feel phantom ants everywhere. Every time sure. one of my hair moves in a breeze, I'm like, is there an ant on my arm now? So yeah, I, I try to read through that part really quickly and not think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Taylor, Taylor's desperate. It's like you said, she did, she doesn't have her, her costume on her bitch had gone outside to confront the, the skinheads. Taylor's looking around for anything that she can use as a mask ends up covering herself in, in bugs and <laughs> walking this, this swarm out to help bitch knock these guys down and on her way out. She had sent a text to the rest of the team saying, Hey, we've got issues here. We need backup and Gru is on his way, but not before one of the, uh, uh before the youngest of the skinheads shoots at Taylor's, uh, swarm clone. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't kind of see this one coming. Taylor had used a similar gambit with the uh, bombs to set them off when they were uh, fighting Bakuda, but brilliant uh, that she was able to come up with another use for this. And uh, I think it helped that it was a, a younger member that was, you know, unfamiliar with, you know, trying to kill people with a gun. So that probably saved her life as well. But uh, yeah, getting us you know yeah as you said a, a bug swarm clone of herself and getting them to shoot the guns at that definitely kept them occupied and and started freaking them out <laughs> yeah and she was able to to use the cover of the of the uh of the insects to lunge at and take down the uh the 12 year old kid who had the had the gun and ended up stabbing him covered him in bugs at the same time freaked everybody out they didn't know what was going on that uh that basically broke the will of the of the skinheads and they raised an angry fist and said <laughs> you know you haven't heard the last of us we're gonna go tell kaiser blah 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 but it, it worked and and they retreated yeah one thing there that i thought was pretty cool was that again taylor repurposed something from earlier where she used like her voice in a different way and right. try, to, try to modulate things and play on their fears that, you know, that we all have about bugs, but that she was somehow impervious and uh, that, you know, she had become part bug or something. And, and uh, yeah, that, that definitely got some people looking a little wild eyed and, and uh, ready to turn tail and run. So that, that helped the situation. Yeah. Because um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Take much as uh, Tattletale had said to Glory Girl that she was a mind reader. Taylor implied to these guys that the, or she stated it, that bullets couldn't hurt her when she was in this quote form, which definitely got inside their heads, and that helped break their spirit and ended their attack. Right. So Brian shows up. This this whole thing is is. Empire 88 trying to to expand into the docks. I think that had been mentioned in one of the earlier arcs that, um, yeah, uh, the thug that that Glory Girl had been interrogating said that he was going to uh, Kaiser wanted to expand to the docks. And so this, I think, is now that the truce against the ABB is off. This is part of that part of that big move. So Brian and Taylor convince bitch that it's wise to move her dogs to relocate to a safer location to keep the dogs safe initially uh, bitch was of the mind that you know this is cowardice we shouldn't be running away but taylor helps her see the the logic and and that her responsibility is to protect the dogs again understanding rachel's point of view yeah it's 
it's an unfortunate turn of events. It seems like this is a great setup and, and Rachel's really done a great job trying to make it work, but it's like the, the government coming and saying they're going to put a freeway through your house. Here's some money. You got to move. You know, there, there really isn't a choice. She can't be there 24 seven. They're, they're her pack. They're her kids almost, you know, she can't leave them in a vulnerable state and unprotected. So she's finally seals sees the, the reason and realizes Taylor isn't trying to yeah, point out some flaw that Rachel has. And as, as she ends up agreeing with the team and Brian goes to call coil to arrange transportation for, for Rachel and her dogs, Rachel offers some <laughs> interesting advice to Taylor. <laughs> she, she susses out immediately that, that Taylor has a thing for, for Brian and, and calls her out on it. And to Taylor's credit, Knowing that that Rachel would appreciate honesty, Taylor admits, yes, I do like this cute guy. Didn't see this coming at all. And and Wild Bo has has definitely kind of led us down the path that, you know, Rachel is maybe more canine brain than human brain. So, you know, you don't think that she's trying to figure out anything that's going on with anybody else most of the time. But yeah, she's. And you're right. It's kind of more of a pack mentality thing. You know, it's like, well, if one dog was interested in another dog, they just go for it. Yeah. And so she's kind of taken that approach to it. And, but yeah, Taylor's very stunned that Rachel's picked up on that and then kind of offering advice on top of it. So Rachel is going to stay at the, at the dog shelter and get things packed up. Brian and Taylor head back to the loft. Now, nobody else responded to Taylor's to Taylor's text. They get back to the loft. Brian is pretty pissed off at Tattletail at, at Lisa and Alec for not responding. Uh, when they arrive, Lisa's on the phone. Alec is on the on the TV playing a video uh, video game or something, and or watching the news. And it turns out that. Coyle has made his next big play and has dumped all kinds of information tying Empire 88 to their civilian to their civilian uh, identities. And that's breaking all over the news. Before we get into that. Yeah. I, and I think a great way of framing why Brian is so mad is, you know, just like anybody, they. Taylor and Brian have kind of probably jumped to the conclusion that something bad must have happened. Oh, certainly. And, and so as they approach the loft, you know, they get in, get the darkness going. He silences the stairs. He silences the door. You know, they're, they're all ready to, you know, see Re reasonable precautions under oh, the circumstances. For sure. Yeah. You don't, you know, I'm, I'm envisioning one of those scenes like when, the minions of the bad guy have tossed the apartment trying to find the stolen data tapes. And, uh, you know, people there, you see a foot sticking out around the couch in a pool of blood or something. And, uh, and then, you know, there's the line Taylor saying, or thinking, I didn't anticipate the scene in the living room of the loft. I'm thinking, Oh man, this is worse than I thought, but no, they're just sitting there. watching. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I would be flipping a table at that point. If I was yes. Brian. Yes. Lisa's on the phone with Coyle and discussing what's what's happened and and getting her giving him her input on this. She's not happy about it at all. She says this. Or excuse me, when Brian uh, or Taylor was asked her about this and uh, ask her how this went down, if she had helped Taylor asked if she had helped Coyle. And Lisa responds only a little. He had asked me a few times to give him thoughts on some stuff, put him on the right path, eliminate possibilities. I didn't think he'd get this far or go this far. Once I got him on the right track, he apparently used private investigators and hackers to dig up the rest of this and get photographic evidence. Lisa's problem is that this crosses a line and an unwritten rule. You don't bring family members uh, if you're a cape, you don't bring other capes family members out and, or their, their civilian identity. You don't give that out. And he's violated that, that uh, crossed that line. 
Yeah, this this was curious. I mean, Coyle is a master strategist and, you know, master of destiny or whatever. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but you got to figure that, you know, he's he's got all sorts of wheels within wheels on why he's doing it this way. But it seems counterintuitive when you're hoping someone will join you and you've given him a week to think about it. And then, you know, you kind of pour gasoline all over their front lawn and set it on fire and then say, what do you think? Still want to join me? Right. Uh, So it's hard to know where this is going to go. It seems like he's, I don't know, maybe this is a way for him to try to draw all of empire 88 out and get everybody united against them so that they can be wiped out. And there's no stragglers left, but yeah, this is kind of like, you know, the undersiders are like that goat in Jurassic park. That's yeah. to the chain to get yeah. Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rex to show up. This is, this is, yeah, all sorts of bad. I would not be want to be the undersiders right now. And, and, and Taylor pot uh, points out the unfortunate timing of this whole thing. They just happen to get into a fight with a bunch of uh, empire 88, uh, soldiers at the same time, nearly at the same time that this information is dumped to the press. And it's just not good. Yeah. And maybe I've watched too many of these kind of, I don't know what you would call it, conspiracy type things uh, with different TV shows where there's some group, you know, that's hiding in plain sight, so to speak, and, yeah. you know, pulling strings from behind the scenes. But, you know, maybe it isn't a coincidence. Maybe somehow Coyle was orchestrating or slipping information to these folks to get them to know Rachel was there and really encourage them to move in. I, You, you just don't know. And, and that's the problem where, you know, you, you feel like you got to get the tinfoil hat out, you know, and it's just... <laughs> Well, maybe it was this. Maybe he made this happen too. You know, interesting. Maybe, so maybe he's maybe he's Rachel's dad, and he did something that would make her turn into the way she was, so that she would be there. You know, you just got to stop going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> so we find out uh, some of the names of of some of the additional uh, members of of Empire Eight. Eight. We find out. Uh, well, we knew Purity's identity, and we did know Kaiser's. We find out who Finya and Minya are. We find out uh, Krieg, the Crusader, Knight, and Fog. So, so Kaiser, or, pardon me, Coyle has has dumped all the information he found, and the Undersiders are just feeling kind of uh, kind of betrayed, not betrayed, but certainly blindsided by this. As we move into into Chapter Five, the team decides, following Brian's recommendation recommendation the team decides to split up lisa alec and lisa and alec are going to go grab rachel and head to a safe location and brian and taylor are going to go back to his place yeah and i immediately thought this seems kind of weird you know why wouldn't they all go their separate ways or uh, why would they all stay together? I mean, I get where you want somebody else to be able to come rescue a group if if something bad's happening to them or if they get discovered. But we just saw where, <laughs> you know, Alec and Lisa at least aren't the most reliable. So I was kind of surprised by the, Brian's decision here. You think I, so? would... I I kind of got it. I mean, uh, I see what you're saying, and and. I'm going to give Lisa a little bit of a pass because of her explanation with about her phone dying and she hadn't activated the new one. Alec is the one who punked out and and, and wasn't on his job. I, I get Brian's reasoning, I think, about having two separate groups so you could mount a rescue or be a diversion for, for the other group. Now, as long as everybody's on the same page and we're following our rules of communication and, and staying in touch, I get it. I always in these situations fall back on the wisdom of Scooby-Doo and that is, you know, don't split up the group. (laughs) This is all sorts of bad stuff can happen. And so I don't know. I, 
I give Alec a pass a little bit because he is a knucklehead. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you, I wouldn't rely on him to, you know, put the next roll of toilet paper on the, on the toilet paper <laughs> roll. Uh, he's just too, I don't know, self-involved or whatever, but Lisa is, you know, I would think she would have been more on top of it. It's easy to forget. These are all, you know, teenagers yeah. at some level. Yeah. Uh, and you think, but yeah, I, I sometimes think of them as like, you know, Jason Bourne and they just have, you know, a safety deposit box with the extra passports and a gun yeah. and the denominations, of different currency and, and three cell phones ready to go. So I don't know. I would, I would think if I were Brian, if I were the leader and two people just screwed up, I'd be like, you two screw ups are with me. So I can mm. keep an eye on you. Uh, Taylor, you know, the lay of the land back there where Rachel is, you seem to be connecting better. Why don't you go get her? She'll listen to you. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm kind of second that's reasonable, things, but that's, that, that's pretty sound reasoning. Yeah, I, I, I feel you. So Alec kind of grumbles about this and Brian smacks him down a little bit and says, look, dude, I'm pissed off enough at you right now. Um, you need to be glad you're not coming, uh, coming to my place. <laughs> Sounds like Brian would be, be on his case all night if, if he were around Alec. So better, better for Alec to be going with, with the other two that makes sense. But I, I don't know. This isn't the first time this kind of thing has happened. So I could see Brian being mad for a while, but I would think it would peter out pretty fast. It's not like, you know, somebody got shot or something. I mean, it was, it was bad, but it wasn't horrible. Yeah. To your point. I mean, Brian, what they've been together 10 months. I think you're to your point, Brian should know who Alec is by now. <laughs> yeah. So, so Taylor and Brian hop a bus and are going to on their way back to his place. Brian asked if she minds stopping at a mall to grab a few supplies as they hop on, as the bus is on its way to the mall, they stop the bus stops to pick up passengers. And among the passengers is the wonderful Sophia and let it be known that I hate Sophia. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if, if there are any actual villains involved, uh, Sophia would qualify in my book. Yeah, she is not a nice person. No. And we get this moment uh, after a few few minutes of riding on the bus. Sophia doesn't notice Taylor at first, and then she does. And then we get this moment where I actually kind of let out a, a yes <laughs> when I read this. <laughs> Where Taylor, once Sophia sees her, Taylor engineers a kiss from Brian. And I think I, I'm, I'm, a sh I'm sure that arc one Taylor would not have done this. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that one. One thing that I think kind of precipitated this, though, was that Taylor saw Sophia checking Brian out. Right. And, you know, Brian seemed oblivious to it, but, you know, I think Taylor instantly saw, well, yeah, she noticed him. So she's going to notice it a lot more once she sees me and him together. Right. But uh, yeah, back in arc one, I think she would have just tried to hide behind the seat or something and uh, hope, see, hope Sophia didn't see her yeah. and get up at the get off at the next stop or something. So. Yeah, and and you're you're completely right. She would have she would have hidden behind Brian, stayed out of Sophia's line of sight, and as for as long as possible, pending their uh, exit at the at the at their bus stop or the yeah at their bus stop at the mall. But this is a more confident Taylor. She is growing, and I like this. I like it's not just about Taylor. It's not just about Skitter becoming a better supervillain. It's about Taylor becoming a more confident person. I really like that. Uh, that's a great point. And I, I agree. She, uh, and this is, this is kind of typical, you know, when you are thrown into the meat grinder, so to speak, it, it definitely does makes the mature maturation process speed up. And, uh, she's, 
yeah, learning, learning what it's like to be Taylor, what, how she wants to be, how she wants to act and, and not just in her head all the time about, Oh, I should have done this. Or why didn't I do that? Why do I put up with this? Now she's saying, I don't like this. How can I change it? This is the action I'm going to take. Yeah. It's, it's some, some good writing. Yeah. So as uh, Brian and Taylor head into the mall, they pass by an electronics store and in the windows are televisions displaying the information and the news about empire 88 and the news is spreading. Brian and Taylor continue on their way. Brian's heading over to a grocery store. Taylor decides she wants to stop at a bookstore to try to pick up a book on dog psychology. And while she's shopping, our, our good friend Sophia shows up. I just have to roll back one second because sure. the post kiss awkwardness. Oh yeah. Was something that I lived through so many times at that age where you put yourself out there and you get this kind of blank look or you, you know, you don't get the response you want. And then it's just like this, not, in your stomach and all the rest of your body, you can't breathe. You can't see, right. You know, that talks about her just trying to put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And so I, I thought wild Bo did a great job of capturing that feeling almost to the point where I was like, you know, 1980 flashbacks, but uh, luckily it didn't get that bad. <laughs> I, I also like the, I don't know, man, it, the description, how wild Bo wrote, Taylor's feelings when she kissed him. I, it was almost poetry um, describing the calm she felt. And I don't know, that may be a little hokey, but uh, I, I, again, I liked it. It was, it was put together pretty well. I did forget about that, but I fully agree. It's uh, you know, it's easy to kind of do the fireworks and bells going off or whatever. And, and he did kind of a different take on it and, but it really fit with the scene, you know, right. because Here's one of the, the worst bullies. And usually the, the feeling is powerlessness or hatred, what have you. And instead Taylor takes some action and she gets this total sense of peace almost that I don't know how it's going to go from here, but right now this feels perfect. And uh, I'm glad I took the action that I did. So that was very, that's a great point. It was almost poetic. So we get this fight between Sophia and Taylor in the bookstore. Sophia comes up behind Taylor, grabs her by the hair, shoves her to the ground, tries to rip her ear off. Sophia has some personality issues, man. <laughs> uh, she's not just a mean person. This girl's got issues. Yeah. And I don't, I, I get, I'm guessing wild blow wild bow will flesh that out more later. Yeah, I just pictured her as one of those kind of quote unquote mean girls in high school, you know, that just like to, they don't feel, you know, all everybody in high school, no matter how popular they are, feels like they don't know what's going to happen and they they have angst, you know, and, and the mean folks just take it out on others. They don't know how to deal with it. But yeah, she's like a level above that. And uh, I was, I was pretty surprised at how violent she was. Yeah. Oh man, she was, it was bad. Taylor, while she's being held to the ground and her ears being wrenched, Taylor's running through her, her list of weapons that are, that are available to her and grabs a book and jams it into Sophia's side and fights back, gets to her feet. That sh shocked Sophia that Taylor was ready to go for another round. Yeah, it was, it shocked me as well. I mean, it, it makes sense that even without the costume, Taylor is, is thrown into fight mode. And so she's going to react like she's in costume and yeah, try to find something to, to gain leverage, something to get in the upper hand and yeah, they're in a bookstore. So yeah, book getting hit by a book can hurt pretty bad if you use the edge for sure. So yeah, she had no choice. She had no choice because um, as she was thinking through her options, she couldn't use her, her bugs that she was carrying on her person uh, without revealing herself. So she had to grab a weapon. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about that, but that's a great point that kind of 
harkens back to the question from the beginning. I think if if she was liking being a villain, she would have done, you know, wasp sting to the brain on Sophia and then just walked out of the store with Sophia dying in the background. So she's she's still trying to, you know, she's not going there. She she wants to try to just resolve this without it escalating. So I think there's there's that point where she's she's not enjoying having to fight back, but no. she's not going to take it anymore either. Exactly. She is she is not the girl in arc 1 who got the soda ju- dumped all over her in the stall as she's eating lunch all by herself. This is a new and improved Taylor. Exactly. Brian shows up as the confrontation is about to go into round two. Sophia tries this lame lie about, oh, I'm mad at her because she cheated on my test and got us both suspended. And Taylor's like, yeah, that's BS. This is Sophia, one of the girls who's been been uh, harassing me. Brian makes it clear that he understands what's going on. They end up heading toward the toward the front where the owner of the bookshop steps in between Brian and Taylor and Sophia. Sophia ends up escaping. The old man doesn't really buy the Sophia attacked me story. I think Sophia is a, is a master manipulator and, you know, she's got this mean streak. I'm getting the sinking feeling that she's a, a, a parahuman that's just waiting for a trigger event. Really? And that she's going to be a bad butt down the, down the road. There's going to be just like, you know, Gru has the, the rival, if you will, or the nemesis. I'm oh, thinking, um, shadow stalker. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking Sophia is going to be right. Cause shadow stalker was a probationary member of the wards because she was using bolts and, and she went too far. Right. When she was acting as a vigilante. And yeah. so you think Sophia is just a trigger event away from being something. That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's my prediction. Okay. All right. <laughs> Book it. <laughs> let's, let's, let's see where that goes. All right. Okay. So Brian and Taylor leave the mall and head over toward his apartment. And as they're going, I think this, correct me if I'm wrong. This is what you were touching on. Taylor opens up to Brian about her feelings, her, her actual feelings for her, for him. He had asked her about that favor on the bus about the kiss and Taylor. Hey, she puts herself out there. Yeah. I like you. These are my reasons why. And I mean, if you were a teenager, you had this happen to you. Brian breaks her heart, not meaningful, not meaning to, but he was honest and it was two people being honest with each other. And this one put, put herself out there. And unfortunately she didn't get the response she wanted. Yeah. And, Wild Bo really steered us toward the possibility that, you know, Brian felt the same way. And, but like you said, we've all been where Taylor was, where we have wishful thinking about, oh, that was some kind of signal, right? Sure. And, and Taylor's totally new to this too, you know, and Brian, as he states, you know, he's like, well, I don't, I don't know how this is supposed to work. I haven't focused on this part of my life at all. So, you know, it's, I, I was just thinking of you as a friend or a little sister and yeah, those are just like, yeah, that friend zone is, oh my gosh, that's a horrible place to be. Yes. And so poor Taylor, she's just kind of, Hey, okay. I understand this. Can we drop it now? And she's really just kind of floundering emotionally. She said at one point, if she did, she'd had privacy. If she'd have been by herself, she, she probably would have cried. And, and you get it. You feel for her. We are truly invested in this girl, both in and out of her, her costume as a cape and as a civilian and, and wild bull can conjure up emotions that uh, we didn't realize we had for her. Yeah. She's, she's very three-dimensional. She's, yes. she's got all sorts of different aspects to her, not your typical, super soldier. I got injected. That's my origin. And now I'm going to go fight the Nazis. It's uh, yeah, it's a very well-rounded character. That's pretty cool. They get to Brian's apartment. Brian is going to clean up the, the 
skin tear that she has on her ear and uh, this begins treating it. And as she turns, as Taylor turns on the news, we find out that purity from empire 88 is raging and is not happy. Turns out that the PRT and child protective services went to her home while she was at work and took her baby daughter. And as Lisa put it, mama bear snapped. Well, yeah, I, that doesn't seem near strong enough. Uh, you would think if, I don't know, maybe I just don't have a super villain mindset, but you would think that she would go and try to break out and get the kid out, not just start, you know, taking down half the city, hoping that eventually she'll coerce them into giving her the kid back. I don't know. It just seems like from that interlude where they introduced purity, Mm -hmm. you know, you got the impression that there was some good in her, but that there was some, some bad that was just kind of waiting for like another trigger event, you know, and this, this just pushed her over the edge and uh, she just doesn't care anymore. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm overstating that, but she just seems to have gone off the deep end now. What purity is doing is doing strafing runs around the docks. There's a cameraman brave soul that he is uh, filming for one of the news channels, filming purity's destruction. At one point, purity levels the dog, the makeshift dog shelter that Rachel had set up. Taylor and Brian are on the phone with Lisa and they're discussing their options and they decide that they're, they're going to, to meet up again. Purity calls out the undersiders. She goes over and they, her and a couple of her minions accost the cameraman and they call out the PR. She calls out the PRT, the undersiders and says, I'm, I'm laying waste to this place until you bring me back my baby girl. We are not the ABB. We are stronger. We got more capes and we just don't care. And to which she gives a rather graphic demonstration, two of her followers, she orders to attack the, the poor cameraman and she films it from, from, uh, up high kind of a, you don't see it. It's not exactly displayed, but it is, it does sound pretty graphic. Yeah. It's, uh, again, I get kind of where she's coming from. Nobody, you know, we, we would all do whatever we needed to do to protect our child, but there's just that, that evil twist in there that it's like, okay, I'm going to kill innocent people to show you that you need to give me my kid back. You know, the whole show of force dominance kind of thing, but yeah, it's, it's very creepy. And it's one of those kind of Alfred Hitchcock things where it's like, it's almost more gruesome by not being at all blood and guts. You know, it's more of a psychological thing. Yeah. A less is more kind of thing. Exactly. So yeah, the, uh, the, minion or the subordinate fog he turned and literally into a mist shrouded shrouded the cameraman the other member knight entered the fog something happened blood comes spraying out and when fog recongeals there's nothing left of this this poor cameraman purity drops the camera and uh, makes one more threat and then heads off the undersiders decide, you know what, we've, we've got to regroup and, and go over our options. Taylor and McGrew call coil, hop in a, hop in a ambulance and that ride goes wrong. Boy, I guess, uh, you got to figure the city's going to be in an uproar. You know, they've got a wrecking ball down in the docks and whatever else is going on. There's everybody seeing all this stuff on TV about the whole, uh, roster of the empire 88 and then uh, the poor cameraman as you said uh, getting wiped out and uh, so they're they're trying to lock things down you know the uh, law and order folks are trying to take control of the situation as best they can trying to protect folks that kind of thing and here's this roadblock and doesn't seem like a big deal but then all of a sudden uh, more empire 88 shows up during the ride, now, Coyle had sent an ambulance to, to pick up Gru and, and Skitter. 
and it was a modified ambulance and had a, a couple of large boxes for her to put uh, to put her bugs in. During the ride, there was we're on the other side of that conversation now, and there's some tension, noticeable tension between between Gru and Skitter. Do you think that the awkwardness of their relationship, do you think this will affect their effectiveness as a team? Um, it's hard to say, you know, when you kind of build those castles in the sky, as the song used to say, sometimes reality hits and they just kind of evaporate and it's cloudy for a while, but then the sun comes back through other times they come crashing down like a ton of bricks and, you know, there's devastation with the relationship and it's, it's hard to recover from. So I'm guessing uh, Taylor seems pretty good at compartmentalizing and uh, making the best of a situation, even when it doesn't go the way she wants. So I'm, I'm guessing it'll be okay. But, you know, if, if they get to a point where things are less chaotic, things are more stable. And if Taylor starts to, you know, as she grows up somehow become more attractive to Brian for whatever reason, then, things could kind of go the other direction and who knows what happens there, but it's, it's pretty hard to tell right now. Yeah. They're still in that very awkward, chaotic section of the relationship. Okay. All right. So the ambulance goes through a police barricade on their way to meet the the rest of the undersiders and they run smack dab into some of the, the members of Empire 88. They run into Hook Wolf, Storm Tiger, and Cricket. Ambulance gets knocked over, and the team crawls out the back, and it's it's they're they're in trouble. They're 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 in trouble. It's it's not a good situation. Yeah, it's uh I mean, they are coils people driving the ambulance, so right. You figure they're some of his super soldiers or whatever, but still, yeah, their, their vehicle got knocked over. So they're all, uh, in dis, you know, all disrupted and, and, uh, upset the apple cart, so to speak. And so they're having to figure out what to do. And, and Gru's trying to tell them, Hey, wait a minute. I, you guys are, are pretty good and all that, but it's really three against two. So maybe we should, uh, fall back. And it seems like the right, right way to go. But uh, as usual, Wild Bow has some parahuman uh, side effects or powers that we don't expect, uh, kind of in his hip pocket. Yeah, it turns out these, but these three particular people, Hook, Wolf, Storm, Tiger, and Cricket, were involved in underground parahuman. I don't know, mixed martial art death matches. Fight Club, yeah. <laughs> Fight Club, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't something that I thought, but it makes sense in a world of, full of capes. Yeah, sure, not everybody's going to be uh, a hero. Some people are going to fight underground, I guess. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me in a slightly different way of that movie Real Steel, where uh, it's like, oh, let's get androids to fight each other. That way we don't have to worry about you know, people dying or whatever. We just rebuild the androids. No big deal. So here we have the same thing with, with parahumans, you know, well, they'll probably heal or they'll have somebody that can heal them. So they can take tons of damage. We don't have to worry about other people getting hurt. They can pack a bigger punch. So it's even more exciting or more disgusting, depending on how you look at it. And uh, so, yeah, it makes sense in hindsight, but uh, didn't see it coming. As they get ready to escape out the, the back of the overturned, the overturned ambulance, Gru floods the area with his darkness. Gru and Skitter and the two paramedics, Coils people, head out the back. And despite his darkness, one of, uh, one of Storm Tiger, excuse me, is actually able to see or to sense where the team is. And that leaves Taylor kind of, kind of scrambling. She tried to save the, the paramedic she was guiding. And this guy was, it looks like he was able to smell where they wore inside of Gru's darkness. 
I mean, again, it makes sense. He's supposed to be a tiger, right? So, sure. uh, but yeah, didn't see it coming. Another nice twist from wild bow. Yeah. The, the darkness that had been and silence that had been working so well, all of a sudden is, uh, not near as helpful this time. And that brings us to the end of chapter seven. Uh, anything to, to add at this point? I don't think so. Uh, really enjoying it, taking a, a pretty different twist than I expected. You know, I figured it would be more of a kind of a mop up cleanup type thing with coil working in the shadows and them joining him and that kind of thing. And instead not only has, have they gone from the frying pan into the fire, but uh, yeah, somebody dropped some napalm in there too. So yeah, we got a, Another es- escalation in the level of violence that the, that the undersiders are having to deal with. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So this is the end of part one. We will be covering the remaining chapters in the arc in our next episode. And once again, at that time, Andy will share his overall impressions and his choice for key character of the arc. So for now, I'll be saying thanks for joining us. And we hope to catch you in part two. Take care. Thanks for coming along with us on this ride and, you know, keeping my fingers crossed that Skitter and Gru are able to somehow escape uh, these uh, Empire 88 folks. So tune back in next time. Thanks for joining us in this podcast. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we'll hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not? from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more in the link down below. Catch you later.